about you and me and Uganda and where we are going and because of that we want you to be a part of the discussion. While we do have some very big heaters to lead the discussion on our behalf, we want you to be involved by using the Spotlight UG hashtag, that is hashtag Spotlight UG, so you can be a part of the discussion and share your thoughts on how we can be able to develop sustainable tourism development in Uganda because it has a lot of potential for us as a country and we'll be talking about that tonight. Without further ado, let's meet our panel for this evening on Spotlight UG. natural resource conservation and wildlife management expert with 29 years of experience working with the Uganda Wildlife Authority, the African Wildlife Foundation and the Greater Virunga Transboundary Collaboration Secretariat. With a forestry background, Sam has successfully rehabilitated degraded national parks and headed the planning and conservation departments for Uganda Wildlife Authority. He later became the Executive Secretary for the Greater Virunga Transboundary Collaboration Secretariat, coordinating wildlife conservation and fighting illegal wildlife trade across three countries. Sam is now the Chief Executive of the Uganda Wildlife Authority, where he manages wildlife both inside and outside protected areas, develops tourism policies, mobilizes resources, builds partnerships and ensures governance and accountability. Trust some to sustainably manage Uganda's precious wildlife resources. A very good evening to you, uh, Dr. Sam. Welcome to Spotlight UG. Is it safe to say that you have been looking after animals your entire life? Not exactly, unless you include uh, the goats and the uh, cats uh, but good, good evening viewers and uh, you're welcome and of Thank course you. wildlife playing a very key part in uh, tourism for uganda and we'll be talking about that as we go throughout the evening let's meet our next panelist management, outreach, veterinary medicine and research. His leadership in wildlife conservation has also recently seen him re-elected as the chairperson of the Pan-African Association of Zoos and Aquaria and he chairs the board of trustees of Ngamba Island Chimpanzee Sanctuary. Dr. Musinguzi has a honors degree in science with education, a master of science degree in environment conservation biology, a master of business administration and a PhD in management from Banana University and Technology. He has published over five scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals. Join Dr. Musinguzi in his efforts to preserve Uganda's wildlife and natural resources for generations to come. We welcome you, Dr. Musinguzi, to Spotlight UG. Good to see you, and I should point out uh, that you have made a lot of us parents look very, very good with the wonderful facilities you have at, uh, at UWEC. I'll tell you from my personal capacity that my son thinks I'm the best father in the world because you have the best kids' play area in the whole of Uganda. Thank you very much, Ben. I am glad to be here, and I'm also glad to hear that positive feedback. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Good evening, viewers. Well, we are not yet done. Let's meet the next panelist. Lydia Rova, Chief Executive Officer, Uganda Tourism Board. Lady Ajarova is a tourism expert and passionate conservationist currently serving as the Chief Executive Officer of the Uganda Tourism Board. 
Ajarova has been recognized for contributing to the Uganda's economic development through tourism marketing and wildlife conservation and management. She is a recipient of the prestigious National Golden Jubilee Award, Tourism Excellence Award, Wildlife Conservation Award, Top Africa 100 Women in Travel, Africa's Most Influential Women in Business and Government among other accolades. Adja Rova has also provided leadership as a member of the Advisory Committee of the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance, who developed policies, standard operating procedures and best practices for the 2022 sanctuaries and wildlife centers in 13 African member countries. She is a proud Rotelian, mother, mentor and educator. Thank you so much, Lily, for joining us this evening. And indeed, you look dashing this evening. Now, a, a female in uh, the tourism industry, how have you been able to you know, manage between work and home and other activities? Thank you. Good evening, viewers. It's a great pleasure to be here at NBS once again. And uh, yes, balancing everything in life. Yeah. It's, uh, to me, the main thing is basically knowing what is of highest priority at a particular time. All right. Thank you yeah. so much. All right. Let's get to our next panelist this evening. Amos Wekesa is an accomplished business leader in the tourism industry with over 10 decades of experience promoting Uganda. He is the founder and CEO of Great Lakes Safaris and Uganda Lodges, overseeing one of the largest tour operators in the region. And a collection of four unique safari accommodations in Uganda's most popular national parks. Amos is also a leading consultant and advocate for social and economic development through tourism initiatives. He has received numerous awards and sat on multiple boards, including the Uganda Tourism Association and the Presidential Investment Roundtable, Tourism Technical Working Group. Amos has addressed the United Nations General Assembly and been featured on CNN's African Voices, and his success is promoting local tourism in Uganda has earned him regional and continental awards. Um, as always, it's very difficult to have a discussion around tourism without talking about you. Amos, welcome to Spotlight UG. Good to see you. And in particular for you, being with us, I know that most of our viewers might not be aware, it's a, an extra blessing for you to be with us because uh, you have some interesting marks on your forehead that... Uh, <laughs> battle wounds. <laughs> battle wounds, I think we can call them. That. You're welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Ben. When uh, reading the CV, I was wondering who are they reading about? So thank you for bringing me before this distinguished, with these distinguished members of society. So as a street hustler, I'm very blessed to be here. <laughs> and street hustle is very important for Ugandan tourism because it's what really matters at the end of it all. Uh, let's meet our last and final panelist on Spotlight UG tonight. Rin Silva Katusime also known as Mama Tourism, is the Permanent Secretary and Accounting Officer of the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities since 2016. Doreen also previously worked in the Ministry of Health, Education and Sports, Commerce, Cooperatives and Marketing, and in the Ministry of Natural Resources as Principal Assistant Secretary, Senior Assistant Secretary and Social Secretary at the State House Entebbe, attached to the office of the First Lady, Doreen Silva Katusime holds a Master's Degree in Management Studies, Public Administration and Management, Uganda Management Institute, Post Diploma in Public Administration, Makete University, and Uganda Management Institute, Certificate in Law Administrative Officers, Law Development Center, Bachelor of Arts Honors with Concurrent Diploma in Education, Makerere University. The Ministry of Tourism has registered an enormous transformation since 2016, from its previous misconception as leisure sector to its now prestigious performance as one of the leading foreign exchange earning sector in Uganda, which has earned Doreen Silva a special name, Mama Tourism.
Yo, welcome to the show. I guess we should say Mama Tourism. You don't seem to be objecting to that name, so I hope you can give us permission to, to use that. Welcome to the show. <laughs> thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Lorin. I'm delighted to be back at NBS. First of all, I, I was not aware that I am called Mama Tourism till now. I find it hilarious, <laughs> but I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. It's good to see all of you. And again, uh, a big thank you to all our viewers watching us on NBS TV and UBC TV as we start this discussion now. A couple of days ago, the President of the People's Republic of Uganda, His Excellency President Yoweri Museveni, pronounced himself on a number of issues, and in particular on what we need to be doing to achieve what we're talking about tonight, and this is sustainable tourism development. Let's take a quick look at what he had to say about this. into ecstasy, the riot of flora and fauna, the breathtaking landscapes and a gentle year-round climate qualify Uganda to be the pearl of Africa. Last year, Uganda fetched about 2.7 trillion shillings from tourism, representing 12.2% of total exports and 41.4% of service exports. But the potential for growth remains. In bid to exponentially increase Uganda's tourism income over the next five years, President Yuri Museveni recently issued several directives. All hoteliers must fully train their staff and provide information on television screens at their receptions and in their rooms about the country's tourism locations and how to get there. They should also show health and safety standards and how we control disease in Uganda. The four regional air drums should be tarmacked. Business hubs should be opened in the Belgrade and Uganda High Commissions. All products in the trade hubs should bear QR codes to where products originate. UCC directed to work with the internet service providers to offer 5G internet to the air drums. Ministry of Works and Transport direct erect booths that bear Ugandan content. KCCA directed to repair roads in the city and have a garbage truck for each parish. Among private players in the tourism space, concerns about budget allocation to the sector persist. I implore the government that even if it was just, even if it needed $30 million to market the country to get 3 million tourists, the benefits at the airport alone are 10 times the amount of money you've invested. Uganda's ambitious targets notwithstanding, tourism, like other sectors, is at a turning point. All development efforts must incorporate sustainability considerations. But is this a conversation we are equipped to have? How is Uganda taking account of the current and future impacts of tourism, be they economic, social or environmental? What plans and policies are in place to harness the opportunities offered by tourism without neglecting the needs of visitors, the environment and host communities? Can governments support expansion of tourism, conserve wildlife and preserve national cultural heritage all in a sustainable manner? This is Spotlight UG. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's a very wonderful introduction to our show today. Now, a lot of us today will refer to Uganda as the Pearl of Africa. That attribute is, that quote is attributed to Sir Winston Churchill. Before him, many people had referred to Uganda as the Pearl of Africa. Henry Morton Stanley, uh, Barton Hendrick, and many other explorers who had been to this wonderful little place that we call home had referred to Uganda as the Pearl of Africa. But when Sir Winston Churchill came along, he said some very specific things. And I'm going to quote some of the things that you have heard about him and what he said about Uganda. He said, for magnificence, for variety of form and color, for profusion of brilliant life. He talked about bird, insect, reptile, and beast. Vast scale, Uganda is truly the pearl of Africa. Most people stop there. But Sir Winston Churchill actually went further. He said, Uganda is a fairy tale. He said, the scenery is different. The climate is different. And most of all, the people is who he talked about are different from anywhere else to be seen in the whole range of Africa. And then he said, concentrate on Uganda. It is the pearl of Africa. 
But is this pile a bit muddied, maybe? Does it need to be cleaned up? We want to talk about that today. We'll start by asking our panel today to shed some light on their thoughts about Uganda as being truly the pearl of Africa. We'll start with the person responsible for promoting and marketing Uganda. Naturally, this is a question she has to answer quite a lot, Lauren. Uh, Lily Ajarova, Winston Churchill's words, you read them and listen to them, and they almost send shivers down your spine when you know what he's talking about. And yet, many Ugandans don't seem to think about this as our country. From your perspective, how would you relate to Sir Winston Churchill's words about Uganda and how he describes us? Thank you very much, Ben. Um, indeed, it, Uganda, the pearl of Africa, remains our brand, even when it was said many years ago by Sir Churchill Winston. And we have maintained that because it's a phrase that really captures what this country has. And uh, in my own words, as we, uh, we developed the, uh, we refreshed the destination brand and now call it Explore Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Using other words would say, the depth, the range, and the variety of the continent of Africa is found in this country called Uganda because of the diversity. Also to define um, what the pearl of Africa actually mean from the things that we actually see right now. We know that uh, pearl is a gemstone with the characteristics of being rare, precious, beautiful, and that is what this country is. We just have to open our eyes and see this, the beauty, the rare things that we have that other nations do not have, and uh, the precious ones as well that we have. And just to mention some of them, and we know that River Nile is the longest river in the world, and the source is in Uganda. And it's the only place, if you want to see the source of the Nile, you'll find it in Uganda. I mean, it's so accessible to everyone in this country. It's well located that uh, anyone could access it. Um, if we look at the wildlife that we have, I mean, from the endangered species like the chimpanzees, the mountain gorillas, you know, name it, we have them. And that is what is very rare about some of the species that we have, some of the uh, natural resources that we have been gifted with in this country. We have the information available, yes, one might not have been able to visit the mountain gorillas physically and track them, but this information is available. If we are really interested to hear and see, um, we appreciate very much our media partners. I think this information is being passed on all the time. So uh, from the big mammals to the small ones, Let's talk about the birds. You know, we have over 1,080, you know, um, identified species in this country, which represent 50% of what Africa has as a continent. Yeah. And some of these species are even endemic to Uganda. Yeah, you can't find them anywhere else. You can only come and see them here in this country. Um, the culture, yeah. Um, we are talking about the people. Ugandan people are so beautiful, and we are beautiful in so many ways because of the various cultures that we have. From, you know, from the great West Nile where I come from, the Alur land, I mean, we are very beautiful people. So are the people in central Uganda, you know, um, to the western, to the east. I mean, and our culture in the diversity is all very beautiful. And um, we are very hospitable people, and we have been well known by that. CNN, you know, a few years ago recognized, they did their survey, and actually 
recognize that Uganda is the most hospitable. Um, they are the most hospitable people. We mm. are. We are. Right. And um, and I could go on and on. Um, and the, the the main thing is for us to just open our eyes and see it. It's right here with us. Yeah. You know, if we talk about the food, you know, our food is so organic, which if you go to other countries, it will you'll pay a lot more for it than what they actually have. Yeah. So it's very interesting. I'll, I'll come to you, Dr. Sam Wanda, for just to, you know, pick your, your thoughts on this. Uh, all of you have traveled quite a bit, and this is why we're asking you to be able to give um, our viewers some perspective tonight because the majority of Ugandans have not left Uganda to go anywhere else. So for you, Dr. Sam, um, when was it in your many years of travel when you started leaving Uganda to go away, at what point did it click for you that, you know what, I come from probably one of the best countries in the world? Very interesting, but uh, probably start by saying I am not yet a doctor. I look forward to getting an honorary one. Um, I don't have the time to sit down and concentrate to get a PhD. However, my first time out of Uganda was when I traveled to Netherlands to study in 1993. Um, I think it was somewhere around September or so, and I stayed there up to early November. It was just three months, uh, early December, three months, and it was cold. In September, it was cold. And for every other day, it became colder. Now, if you're in Uganda and you are in Kisoro, Ugandans will tell you that it is cold there. But that is extremely warm compared to what I saw in Netherlands at that time. And uh, if you crossed to Kampala, to Koboko, all those areas, extremely warm. If you came from uh, Kidepo in the northeast, crossed to Kamuli, near where my home is, and then you went down to, to, to uh, Kalangala in the islands. The weather is excellent. And so just talking weather alone, we, we have the best that there is. Because just cross, cross the, 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 the boundary and go to, to Kenya, their temperatures are either too high or too, too low. Um, and so that is one thing that we need to think about. But also look at the fact that we have an average of roughly 25 degrees Celsius uh, as temperature, and yet the range is very small. Yeah. Even at midnight, here in Kampala, you can walk out with a shirt. Uh, not, not possible in many places. So the weather is excellent. Yeah. And then the landscape is different. Uh, the landscape is so different that uh, we come from about 600 meters above sea level to over 5,000 meters above sea level. That gives us a variety of climates, uh, climates that really make this place a beauty. When I was flying to Netherlands, and I've flown out of this country many times because of the job I do, we passed over this desert uh, of Egypt. And I now have been to the, the uh, Saudi Arabia and Dubai. And you know, we waste a lot of time as Ugandans going to, to suffer in the heat of, of Dubai. When we have beautiful weather here, wonderful places to go, I don't know how many of us have been in Karamoja. Karamoja is a beauty, just driving in those flat areas, and then you, out of nowhere, you find a, a rock outcrop or a mountain, uh, and the vegetation that goes with this, this is the best place in the world to be. And so, all of us need to love our country yeah. and really uh, explore it. Actually, the brand of Uganda now is Explore Uganda 
the power of Africa. Absolutely. Let's explore this country. You will be amazed at what we have. And, and again, that's, that's the whole point of our discussion tonight because for the majority of our viewers, um, it's, it's very easy to take for granted if you don't know what you have with you. Um, uh, Lauren, you, have, you, have you traveled around the world a bit? Um, I'll be very honest with you. I've, um, I'm more familiar with my home area. I'm from Kasese, so yeah. I'm more familiar with Queen Elizabeth National Park. So it's just pretty much home to me. But I, after the show, definitely, I'm Wait, going to so make it a point. You've only visited... Queen Elizabeth National Park. Yeah, it's that home. That doesn't count because it's home, so you haven't visited. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I invite her to, to Kidepo? Yeah. Yes. At my please. cost? Yes. At, oh, wow. Yes. There, there is yes, an offer. Yes. Thank you very much, Thank Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, can I tag along as her bodyguard for that? <laughs> Am I allowed to cheer? <laughs> <laughs> she will decide. <laughs> no, so it, it's very interesting that we yeah. talk about this. Um, I, I've had the pri and we'll talk about this as we go throughout the show. I've had the privilege of um, traveling across this country, and I remember the first time I went to Kidepo. We woke up in the morning, uh, you know, going to have breakfast. It was staying in the Ua camp, mm -hmm. and right outside our window, as in you, you open the window on your small cottage, mm -hmm. and there's about 24 zebras and five rhinos eating wow. right outside. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you cannot experience anything like that anywhere else in the world. Right. Apart from Uganda. Apart from yeah. Uganda. All right, Doreen, I'm going to pose the same question to you. Give us an experience. I would say one of your best experiences whereby you look at Uganda and say, wow, Uganda is truly the pearl of Africa. Um, I should say that every time I travel, and Ben was just asking about travel, every time I fly out of Uganda, and as I come back, before landing in Entebbe, I always look down and I see Uga Uganda looking like an oasis. Yeah. You, you see across, you're flying over Kenya and you see, you know, and then you see the green mm. that welcomes you, apart from the lake, of course, which we share. But in addition to that, I think for me, the two extreme ends of Uganda have been the most fascinating. When I went to, to see the gorillas, and I saw that tr the forest, that impenetrable forest, I had never experienced anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then on the other extreme end, uh, Kidepo, I don't think I have seen that kind of beauty anywhere. My first time to go to Kidepo, as soon as we entered the national park, we found this big lion seated on a rock like, like a king, mm -hmm. like a king on the throne. And he stayed there the entire day. But just seeing that valley and the vegetation and the way it is surrounded by the mountains, I don't think there is any place like that. Mm -hmm. So really, Uganda is beautiful. Wow. Thank you very much, Madam Pierce. Now, I'll take it on with you, Dr. James. I know you have been in this industry for a very, very long time. And uh, I know also sometimes you look at things and like, oh, yeah, it's the same old. But I know that you have also a highlight whereby you look at Uganda as truly the pearl of Africa as that so many people talk about. Give us your experience. Thank you very much, Laureen. Um, <clears throat> I'm fascinated by the ecosystems and the life it, they support in this country. Uh, definitely being lucky that we are uh, astride the equator, it is fascinating how it rains and in about an hour or so it is shining. Mm. It's so fascinating. Like Ben says, we could actually be taking it for granted. But I want to tell you one time I traveled to Cambridge University in March to make a presentation at a conference and I nearly froze. It was terrible. But here, even if it rains, it shines. And you're basically around 25 to about 29 degrees Celsius. The weather is perfect. The food is from the garden to the kitchen. I mean, it's amazing. And of course, the people, the way they are very welcoming and the way they involve you in their activities, especially the people in the communities. So Uganda is great. And I rally Ugandans to really know this because, like you've said, you travel the whole world and Uganda remains the best yeah. that we have. So let's treasure our country. Well, yeah. uh, thank you very much, Dr. Musinguzi. Um, uh, to the, the hustler, um, Mr. Wekesa, you, you, 
you've had the privilege now of being able to run a successful tourism business. Uh, things weren't always like this for you. You grew up a typical villager, so the thought of... Still oh, you still are? Okay, yeah. that's a good yeah. thing. That makes two of us. Yeah. Um, when, when you think about your experience, and again, we're talking about why Uganda truly is the pearl of Africa, uh, at what point in your life, you know, having grown up a, a typical villager, at what point did you come to the actual realization that you came from the best country in, in the world? When, when did that hit home for you? What was that experience? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank NBS for continuously uh, engaging on matters to do with tourism. We don't de take this for granted. So whether you invite me or bring other people, you've played a very key role in making sure that tourism is showcased. I want to thank you for that. Uh, but also before I answer your question, I just want to say a bit of a correction. I, I know my office sometimes gets excited about addressing the UN. No, I was one of the four people that were invited by a panel of experts at the UN to discuss SDG goals, vast, with uh, inclusion of entrepreneurship in the SDG goals. I, was, I represented Africa, and then the former Minister of Finance, Canada, the head of Babson College, which, which is the best entrepreneur school in, in the US, the lady from Israel, so I represented Africa. So it was such a big opportunity, of course. I, I got a standing ovation at that time. Uh, but that was not the UN. I was fighting for the integration of entrepreneurship in the SDG goals. I'm, I was tired of saying MDG goals are, you know, there are poor people there, we need to help them. No, we have lots of potential that we just need to do business. Anyway, that is a, besides the point. I think for me, I came to tourism purely by mistake. And by God's grace, I can say, why? I had failed, I had done my A6, I had failed in, in school, and I remember the first week of May 1996, asking God, you gave me a chance to go to a children's home to get education, and I misused it. And so God, give me a chance, give me a second chance, because it was purely my mistake. On the 23rd, a doctor who is a Canadian working Toro Hospital comes home and says, take that guy to Kampala to study tourism. And that's how they put me on the bus to Kampala to do a certificate in tourism. Even at that time, I actually did not know that this was my destiny. It was God's destiny. Now, I got to understand tourism when I became a tour guide. And one of the reasons why I understood the value of this country was as when you become a tour guide, you see the real sentiment of tourists. I can tell you that you rarely find tourists coming to Uganda as a first destination in Africa. They will have traveled the world along the way they've met a backpack because we're not good at marketing, we should agree. Because we're not good at marketing. So they meet a tourist in South Africa and they say, I was in Uganda. It's probably the most beautiful country in the world. Now, I used to escort these tourists to the airport and you see tourists crying. And you ask yourself, why are you, you ask them, so why are you crying? See, how is it possible that you can be in such a beautiful, incredible country and yet have so much poverty? Then, okay, for, I started asking myself, am I the wrong guy? Because I also had the feeling general Ugandans have about the country. Then I started looking at my country differently. So I, I go to Kidepo, and then it became even more apparent when I used to do Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. I used to do one month. I was single, so I could go away for a whole month guiding tourists in the region. I understand the region very well. Now, if I wanted a tourist to be miserable, I would start from Uganda, go to Kenya through a Heros, go to Kisi, enter Kirigoris, Masai Mara, and go to Nairobi, and enter Tanzania, and finish the Islam. Why? The moment you cross the borders, tourists are asking you, why is it that Uganda is dressed better? Now it becomes my problem. Then Kisumu is still green. Then the moment you enter Kisi and you're leaving now, you enter and you're leaving Kisi going to Kirigoris, it becomes kind of a semi-desert. They start asking you, how can anybody be living here? Because they have seen the experience. By the time you fin finish Da, a tourist is bored. Then I started telling my boss at the time, can we start our trip from Tanzania? So they end up with a highlight called Uganda. Then it gave me a chance to actually study our history in as far as tourism is concerned. That history, if I, I need a whole program next, next time to be able to explain to Ugandans 
why British Overseas Airline Corporation, for example, chose six places in Africa, chose Alexandra, British generally, Alexandra for the, for the access to the canal, Cairo, chose Entebbe, and uh, Soroti, chose Durban in South Africa, and Cape Town. Of course, Ugandans don't know why British Overseas Airline Corporation chose Uganda or in Soroti. It's because that's where British Overseas Airline Corporation, which is British Airways now, used to train its pilots. Then, by, by until 1954, Entebbe Airport was the biggest airport in Africa. That's a fact. That's, that's a fact. In 1954, the Queen of England came to open Owen Falls Dam, and from there she went to Kenya. She had to come with a bigger plane and go in a smaller plane to Jomo Kenyatta Airport in order. That is, she couldn't, this is the biggest airport. That's how powerful it was. In fact, she lost her father when she was in Nairobi, in Kenya, mm -hmm. in 1954, and had to fly back to Uganda and fly to Europe. So we are sitting on goal. I need a whole day to just add on the description where my, my colleagues have met only what makes Uganda unique. Right. But until we believe that, all that means nothing. Do I'll you, give you statistics later would on you, what in comparison fi, compar comparing figures. Would you agree with the sentiment that a lot of Ugandans take our country for granted because they don't know how good we have it? Yes, I do. But of course, you have to, have, you have to understand it. When we were studying in school, we were told about the prairies, rainlands. English was the, the language to speak. So you find a guy in this country with a PhD in economics, and you sit with him down to describe Uganda, and he thinks you are lying about Uganda. That's how bad it is. Even the Minister of Finance, I sit down with these guys, and I keep thinking, why am I explaining to them to sell this country? What am I talking about? Why can they put money in this very obvious environment marketing it? So it, it's a challenge, not only, it's a challenge to the whole population. Right. If you are joining us uh, live on NBS TV and on UBC TV as well, it is Spotlight UG. We're talking about sustainable tourism development in Uganda. My name is Ben Mwine. I'm joined by Lorin Masika Kazimoto as we engage some of the key players in the tourism sector to try and figure out how we can indeed achieve sustainable tourism development in Uganda. We've been talking about why Uganda truly is the power of Africa and would like for you to be a part of this discussion. So share your thoughts, use the hashtag SpotlightUG and tell us what is it about Uganda that makes you truly feel it is the power of Africa? Now, Lorraine, as we talk about tourism and why it's very important, it's not just about how beautiful Uganda is. It's about how that beauty can help us achieve our goals in terms of our NDP3, in terms of our Vision 2040. And again, I'll come back to you, uh, Lily, as the custodian of marketing and promoting um, tourism in Uganda by looking at some of the key figures in terms of how we are doing at the moment uh, as a country. And of course, we're looking at this from the perspective of how can we do better, how can we make sure that we maximize the potential that we have for tourism in Uganda, which, by the way, um, apparently employs at least 10% of all the jobs in the world are in the tourism sector. So if you look across all the economies anywhere in the world, 10, one out of 10 jobs around the entire world will be coming from the tourism sector, which is also worth, I think, about $7.6 trillion uh, dollars globally. No, actually, and this year, the, the world will be earning $8.9 trillion. In 10 years, we'll be earning seven, close to $17 trillion, according to WTTC. So we are approaching $9 trillion as it is. Yeah. So, Lily, where are we um, at the moment as Uganda in terms of how, how are we doing at, at the moment, if you could shed some light in terms of how things have been going for us as a country in maximizing this potential so far. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, where the world was disrupted by the COVID pandemic, so let's, let's start from after COVID. Um, we, we, are, we, we are, for the last two years, the numbers, the numbers are going up in 2021 we had about five we earned about 500,000 US dollars equivalent um, compared to the 1.6 million billion US dollars that we had earned in 2019 pre-COVID and uh, last year 2020 uh, we reached the mark of 800 uh, 
million US dollars and um, it looks brighter even this year and uh, one thing I have to say is that um, we have also intentionally with uh, the segmentation of our market we are getting to see where things are happening more one has been with the domestic market and I'm sure we are seeing the vibe which is going around with the campaigns that we are running um, to get more Ugandans in interested to, to travel their own country. And uh, we are seeing more numbers with the Ugandans traveling and also within the region um, of East Africa, we, we are seeing um, the East African region has always been the biggest market that we have had, and uh, it continues to be f besides the domestic market. And the, inter the international market outside, um, outside uh, East Africa or Africa as a continent uh, is still small, but it is also growing. And um, we, see, we see a lot of the internationals uh, coming more for business, 40% are coming in uh, for business tourism, yeah, about 19.3% are the ones coming for leisure. Um, about 23% are coming to visit friends, relatives. Um, so there's, 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 uh, there's a lot of work for us to do to try and up the percentage of those who are coming for um, for leisure. However, we are also positioning ourselves for business tourism, more in the space of meetings, incentives, conferences, and events, um, other than the trading business. Of course, we also still count that from the definition of who a tourist is, but we are intentionally positioning ourselves more for the, in the my space. And that should be able to earn us a lot more money because it has a double benefit in that when people come for meetings or conferences, you know, then they can also do either a pre or post, you know, meetings, conference, you know, tours. And also a number of international delegates normally travel with their families or partners who when they are not attending uh, to the meetings, they are traveling. So we are positioning ourselves in that space as well. So, and uh, we have established the Uganda Convention Bureau, which is a department within Uganda Tourism Board. And uh, we are pushing very hard by bidding for many international conferences. And uh, we are seeing the results coming. There are a number of... Uh, conferences and international meetings that we bidded for, that we have won for 20, 2024, 2026, up to about 2027, you know, at this point. Uh, what is very challenging though, we can't really bid for very big, like 3,000, 10,000, you know, uh, conference delegates, you know, meetings. Um, so, Facility development is, is still a challenge, but we are happy that, you know, a lot is happening as well in, in that space. Yeah. There's the expansion of the conference facility in Munyonyo. You know, we are seeing in the different cities around the country, uh, a number of facilities are coming up as well. Right this week, we are having 2,000 you know, of, um, of international delegates of the, of, the, of the Rotarians in Barara city. So we want to see more of that. By having them in Barara, you know, it is a challenge. I know within the last few months, um, those who were already making developments were actually trying to rush and finish up so that they can accommodate because there was mm -hmm. not enough. So as we take these big meetings to different cities around the country, we'll see also more development of the infrastructure and the facilities require, yeah. and then we will be able to increase the numbers. So if, if I'm to get you right, Lily, did I just hear you say that at the moment, if I was to try and organize an event that requires 10,000 people, I can't be able to 
host them in this country? Not in one place. Oh, wow. You will have to spread them across the country. Okay, when you say not in one place, you mean not in one location, right? So I can put yeah. them in Kampala. I can put 10,000 people in Kampala yeah. if I needed to, right? Yeah, but not when you are having, uh, you know, they are depending, there are certain sessions where you want everybody in one room. Yeah. So if you are going to host a conference of 10,000 people and for a particular session you want all the 10,000 in one room, we don't have that kind of space as yet. Wow. Yeah. It looks like we have uh, our, our work cut out for us, Lorraine. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Now, to you, Madam Piers, now back then when the ministry was still a directorate in the then Ministry of Tourism, Trade and Industry, and now becoming a full ministry, what has changed? And are we also on the right track in ensuring that tourism is a sustainable sector in the country? Um, thank you, Lorraine. I think those are like three questions in one, yes. but very good ones at the same time. Now, when you talk about sustainable tourism, you're basically taking a, a holistic approach, and uh, you're talking about taking full account of the current as well as future impacts in terms of economic, social, environmental impacts of, of tourism. And therefore, you're looking at the needs of the, the tourists, the needs of the host communities, the environmental needs, and that is exactly what we are looking at at the Ministry of Tourism and uh, the agencies that work, that are affiliated to the ministry. So the ministry became a standalone ministry, I think, in 2011. I joined end of 2016. So in terms of my career, this is, uh, I'm still new <laughs> at the ministry, but I have worked in several other places. Now, the having become now one standalone ministry, of course, has come with a lot of opportunities because now it's, it makes coordination, especially as a ministry that has agencies like Uganda Wildlife Authority, Uganda Tourism Board, it is easier to coordinate under one ministry, but it has also uh, raised the profile of the sector. Today, tourism is a standalone program under the National Development Program. It started by being a sector, now we work under the programs. The, the budget of the sector has grown more than 10 times since it became a standalone ministry. The revenue collections by the different agencies have actually, even in the last three, four years, I should say. 2015, 16, for example, um, I think the agencies were collecting about 60 something billion. Now we are talking about, before COVID, we had reached 130 billion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are targeting, of course, after COVID, um, things went down a bit, but we are projecting to collect about 118 billion in the coming financial year, maybe 200 and something billion by 2025. But I would say that the, the coordination has, has improved. The profile of the sector and the importance of tourism being highlighted has grown. So as, as a standalone ministry, we have been able to pursue that uh, raised profile. We have also, I think, improved in terms of coordinating with the private sector because tourism is really a private sector driven uh, industry. So as a standalone ministry and with agencies that work with us, it has raised the profile of, of tourism as an industry. Wow. Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Pierce. We will we'll, we'll need to talk a little bit, uh, especially about that private sector engagement, and that's why we have uh, Emma Sulkasa with us in the room. Mm -hmm. But you can't talk about sustainable tour tourism development mm -hmm. without talking about conservation, which is very key. And so I'll come to you, Sam, again. This is your forte. This is what you do. Um, how have things been at Uganda Wildlife Authority in terms of conservation to make sure that we are able to achieve this dream? What are the key things that for you um, must be a really key critical focus area for OA if we are going to be able to achieve this sustainable tourism development for Uganda going forward to get to where we need to be? 
Um, thank you, Ben. I think uh, that is a very important question because uh, indeed tourism in Uganda is uh, generally nature-based. The tourists who come are looking for nature. They want to see the animals. They want to see the environment around. Of course, there are those who come for culture, those who come for meetings. But when somebody leaves their country and says, I'm going to tour Uganda, I'm going to explore Uganda, they're looking at uh, visiting uh, places that are natural habitats. So we, as Uganda Wildlife Authority, are focusing on ensuring that the habitats where the animals and the birds are found are in a pristine condition. Uh, that we do in a number of ways, uh, but, but just protecting them from encroachment, protecting the animals from poaching, and ensuring, for example, that if they are invasive species, we deal with them and remove them to provide the animals and the place for the visitors to see. And then we then work on the products. Because if you're coming, yes, you're going to see an animal, but you need the road to reach there. And so within the parks, we manage the roads. Uh, within the parks, we provide boats that take people on the water uh, to see various things. We do trucks that if somebody wanted to do a walk, they're able to walk. And um, that provides the, uh, the, the, the product. And then we have our friends in the private sector. We invite them and say, you come. We have space, invest, uh, provide a lodge, and, you know, make money as you help us to bring in the visitors and also pay us a little something so that we're able to continue the work we do. So we also work with the private sector. They help us with the lodges. Uh, they do a better job at managing lodges than ourselves. We are better at the conservation bit. And so we, you know, we work together uh, and we're able then to, to deal with that. But we are talking sustainable tourism. Uh, you cannot have tourism when the neighbor is not happy. So we also need to deal with the communities. And how do we deal with them? We create the awareness. We deal with their problems, especially related to animals getting into their space and uh, destroying their crops, sometimes uh, their livestock, sometimes injuring or killing them. So we deal with the human wildlife conflict uh, as part of that. But also, we share some of the resources that we pick from the visitors, especially through revenue sharing, but also allowing them to access uh, resources from the park after we've negotiated and agreed on how they will access them. Yeah. And then we deal with various enterprises, uh, for example, sport hunting, or those who want to manage their own animals uh, on their own private pieces of land. Okay. We can also support them to do that. So I can have a lion in my, in my compound? That's what you're saying? Yes, you can have a lion in your compound, but we'll give you a license, and we will work with Uganda Wildlife Education Center to ensure that you have the proper training to not become the meal for the lion. <laughs> which, which we have seen to happen quite a number of times around the world. Yes. Uh, thank yes. you very much, Sam. Let's take a very quick break. Uh, you're watching Spotlight UG on UBC TV and on NBS TV, also streaming live on Afro Mobile with me, Ben Mwine, and Lauren uh, Masika Kasimoto. When we come back, we talk a little bit about the different products that we have that are able to help us sell this pearl of Africa that we call home. But also, as we do that, we'd like to find out from you, have you traveled around Uganda, not for work, but for the sake of traveling? So you're here in Kampala and you say, you know what, let's take a trip and we're going to drive to, I don't know, Arua, just for the sake of traveling. What places have you been to around Uganda? You can share your uh, feedback with us using the hashtag SpotlightUG. Would like to know how many different places um, have you been to around the country? Lorin, apart from Kasese and Queen Elizabeth, um, how many towns? You're going to be our guinea pig for SpotlightUG <laughs> tonight. So um, 
let, let you, you, you start the poll for us. How many different towns or cities across Uganda have you been to so far? Um, I would say a proud eight. A proud eight. Yes. Can you name, uh, can you remember them? So Jinja, obviously, I'm thinking, yeah? Yes, definitely. Okay, in Tebe? Yes. Yeah, Mukono doesn't count because Mukono and Jinja, we count as the same, right? <laughs> Mubende, yeah, you, can, you can't count the ones on the way. Mbarara, I would be thinking. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, where else? Fort Porto. Fort Porto, obviously. Tourism City. Have you been to Arua yet? Uh, not yet. Have you been to Arua? Not um, yet. Gulu? No. Not good. You haven't been to Gulu? No, I oh, haven't. We need, another uh, we need another invitation for you. Wow. Uh, <laughs> let's take a very Today's quick break. my lucky break. day. You, let's take a very <laughs> quick break. Where have you been around Uganda? Share your thoughts with us uh, on Twitter. Spotlight UG is our hashtag. Spotlight UG will be back in just a moment. UBC, inspiring Uganda. Talk with freedom. Get MTN Freedom voice bundles that don't expire. Dial star 100 star 21 hash or my MTN app for more bundles. Together, we're unstoppable. This isn't just a girl. She is the future. This is a teacher. A doctor, a community leader, our future president. She is our family's pride. And as her father, I will protect her from child marriage and talk to her about the dangers of teenage pregnancy. We each have a role to play in empowering our teenage girls to protect them from child marriage and pregnancy because when we empower them, we empower our nation. Protect the girl, save the nation. Take action. Report any case of defilement or child marriage to the police or call Saudi 116. The general public is hereby informed that the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions will hold the Annual Prosecutor's Symposium and the 6th Annual Joan Kagezi Memorial Lecture from 25th to 28th April 2023. The Annual Prosecutor's Symposium is slated for 25th to 27th April 2023 at Imperial Hotel, Kampala under the theme Effective Prosecution of Organized Crimes to Force a Sustainable Economic Development. The 6th Annual Joan Kagezi Memorial Lecture is slated for 28th April 2023 at Speak Resort Monyanyo starting at 9 a.m. under the theme Organized Crime and the Necessity for Witness Protection. His Excellency General Yuwari Kaguta Museveni, President of the Republic of Uganda, is the Chief Guest. Physical attendance is by invitation. Please note that all ODPP stations will be closed to the general public during this period. Are you tired of high fees and slow transfer time when sending money? Look no further. Airtel Money is here to revolutionize the way you move your money. We have revised our rates and now sending money from Airtel to other networks in Uganda, East Africa and to the rest of the world has never been more affordable. Plus, you can trust Airtel Money to get your money where it needs to go quickly and safely. Simply dial star 185 hash and start sending money. Switch to Airtel Money today and experience unbeatable rates and top-notch services for all your local and international money transfer needs. Airtel Money. Instant, secure, borderless. for Lorid Masika Kazumoto, who must be the luckiest woman alive because yes. as we promote sustainable tourism development in Uganda, she's so far received two invitations, including one that has just come from UTB to go and uh, visit Gulu, where she has not been. And I think she's already received quite a barrage of messages saying, yes. Shemun, you, how yes. can you have been to... I have, I have. <laughs> but I know to, that I'm representing Gulu. so many Ugandans who are watching this evening, so... See, yeah, and, and that's exactly the point. We are saying that Ugandans need to be able to um, start visiting their own country. Um, I must say I've had the privilege of traversing this country, and in great part thanks to OA, uh, thanks to UTB and thanks to Amos as well. My very first trip around Uganda 
uh, was back in 2011 when myself, Amos Wekesa, Alan Kasuja at the time, Roger Mugisha, Aisha Alibai, and a bunch of media people took a trip, a four-day trip around the, the national parks. I remember that, that it, like it was yesterday. And it was an incredible experience, and we had a great time. And from that time, I decided that every single year I was going to make some time to travel around Uganda and go to a different part. And I'm honored to have been able to do that, as I'm hoping that each and every one of us will be able to do. But as we talk about this, Lorraine, uh, let's pivot a little bit and then now um, focus on some of the different products that are available for our viewers to be able to partake of when they do start exploring Uganda. Yes, indeed. I uh, wanted to start with you, Dr. Musinguzi. First of all, congratulations on UIC clocking 70 years of existence. I know you have gone through the you know, political turmoils, the poaching, and so many. And I know with the times, uh, some of these challenges have changed over the years. And then now we see a ray of hope for orphaned animals you know, having a second chance at life. Now, what are some of the tourism products that are offered at the zoo, and what do the visitors' vis visitors' numbers look like? Thank you very much, uh, Laurie. <coughs> we, like you've rightly said, we've been we've actually gone through a transformation uh, because, as we speak right now, we are a statutory body established by an act of parliament. And as a result, we've been able to be given mandates that we are supposed to be carrying out. Number one being conservation education, where we focus on environmental education and education for sustainable development. Because as the legendary Nelson Mandela said, education is the strongest weapon you can use to change the world. So we work on the mindset of the people, of the visitors who come, to try and influence them positively towards positive self-conservation action. Because like the famous Jane Goodall said, everybody can do something to save our planet. We rally the visitors, we rally the people we educate to do something positive for the environment, positive self-conservation action. We are saying if you are celebrating a birthday, can you grow a tree? If you are celebrating a ceremony, a marriage ceremony, can you grow a tree? So this conservation education is done at the center in Entebbe, but also we go to communities and schools using an outreach approach. So at the moment, we stand, uh, 2022, we got 406,000 ,406, visitors compared to 2022, where, 2021, where we had 131 visitors, translating into a, an increment of 127%. Oh, so we wow. want to thank Ugandans because 90% of this visitation is actually Ugandans. Mm -hmm. They have supported us, they have visited, and we are grateful for this. We also do rescue, rehabilitation, and release of wildlife as a result of uh, uh, wildlife poaching, but also human wildlife conflicts, as well as um, uh, issues to do with conflicts within the community. So you bring animals to your work, rehabilitate them, and take them back into the wild. And those which cannot go back because of their state remain at the center and are used, or they are representatives of those in the wild, but also act as ambassadors, but also as promoters of, of wildlife and tourism. So the products mainly that we offer at the moment are quite a variety. You can do a behind the scenes program where you get closer to the animals. You can feed the animals. You can do a general tour. You can enjoy the best children play area in the country as alluded to by Mwine. You can also have the long, you can enjoy the longest beach in Entebbe is within uh, the center. But also, Uganda has been recreated at the center. Uganda's ecosystems have been recreated, and the animals that are found there are those that are in the wild. So in other words, UEC or the Zuin Entebbe is the one that is sailing Uganda's protected areas. When you come, you're able to make a decision which national park to go to. And as a result of the transformation, I'm happy to tell you that uh, the Zuin Entebbe is the best in East, West, and Central Africa, as has wow. been audited and are created by the Pan-African Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So we need to take pride about our journey. We also have a children's zoo where we have children and take them from the known to the unknown. So that from the small domestic animals, then they learn about the bigger uh, wild animals that we keep. We not only do work at UEC, we also go to communities and we have some outreach posts, for example, in Makanaga wetland ecosystem. For us to make tourism and conservation sustainable, we need to involve the communities. And therefore, we have set up 
an ecotourism project in Makanaga where the visitors that come, especially foreign visitors, are referred to an outreach outpost where they go and support the communities. We've supported them to set up trails where people go and view the shoe bill, and this is emancipating the communities. So using that model, we are trying to see how we make tourism sustainable, yeah. but also we do captive breeding of endangered wildlife species. We have succeeded very well in breeding lions, and right now we are, are in discussion with the Uganda Life Authority to see how we reintroduce lions back into the wild so that we can see how to enable a visitor see a wild cat when they come to the country so that we contribute to the growth of the population. Say yes, we've come a long way, we are improving, and the products have been varied. You can now come on a Friday at the zoo and go back on a Monday because we have cottages, we have apartments, wow. we have camping sites. It's a self-contained entity at the moment. And I invite Ugandans and non-Ugandans to come and visit, enjoy their country. You see, you learn and enjoy, including both plants and animals. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mosingozi. Uh, and again, I will say this uh, very boldly that I don't think you will find, because for me, usually this sort of experience is one that is key for, especially for families, to be able to introduce memories for our children and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you will find uh, as good an experience if you're within, for example, the Greater Kampala area mm -hmm. than at the, the zoo in, in Entebbe. Though I don't like the snakes, I never go to the house that has the snakes. I just try and, and stay as, as far <laughs> away from. from that as I can. Mm. Um, though my sons always want to go to the snakes, I, I, I fear those things. Um, before I come to, to someone, we'll hear from Madame Pierce and from Lydia as well in terms of the different products that we have um, as, a, as a country. Uh, I'll start with you, Amos. If you're focusing on a Ugandan <coughs> watching Spotlight UG tonight and you're, you're, you're trying to sell to them uh, a product, because normally you sell a lot of your uh, packages to foreigners, right? But if you're focusing on a Ugandan, uh, like Lorene here, who we are trying to introduce in, you know, to domestic tourism, what would you sell to her as the best possible package for her to be able to explore Uganda? Well, I will, uh, thank you again, Ben. Um, but maybe before I answer that, let me first uh, thank the president and and the gentleman called uh, Robo Godrick. I think Robo is, I think, the advisor on exports. You know, for very many years, I've been telling government of Uganda that there's no country in the world that can grow without an external business strategy. In fact, after we are finished with potholes, health, we need to be engaging guys in government. Let me tell you, generally speaking, Across board, I'm not just talking about, I've, I've interacted with many government entities. A lot of people in government understand one side of capitalism, the consumptive uh, capitalism, as opposed to productive capitalism. So whether, so you, that's why you find different ministries, maybe of health, or whatever, defense, everybody asking for money. Very few of them take time to understand where that money comes from. Many of them will hardly understand that we, like for example, look at 2023 and 2024 budget. Our budget is about 50 trillion. As a country, this, 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 that financial year, we'll be able to collect, if we've done very well, 20 trillion shillings. That means that we would have to borrow 30 trillion. Now, if you look at the 50 trillion that we have budgeted, 60% of it is what they call recurring budget. Buying fuel, buying cars, maintaining government people. That's what it is. That's a miserable state. The other one that we all need to understand and learn is that 80 trillion as our national debt is not a lot of money to a nation. However, when a nation is not focused on external business strategies, a poor man growing tomatoes can never grow a poor man growing onions. The two of them can just sync with each other. Now, when you are poor, you, f you focus on producing products for people who have ability to, to spend money in your economy. If you look at America, America has an annual expenditure of 18, a market annually of $18 trillion a year. Uganda 2019 statistics show that we only earned $180 million from the U.S. We should be sitting there, all you educated people, you leave me who failed in school, you educated people must be sitting there and thinking, 
How do we earn $22 billion out of 100, about, out of $18 trillion that America has as expenditure every single year? That's what we should be thinking. Now, I like the fact that, okay, so they called me and said, Amos, you've been talking about a country having external business strategy. And now, we are now serious on these products. And I started thinking, so he's put me in a few meetings, generally across board, you know, we're meeting our culture, meeting. But of course, even generally speaking, People will come to this TV and say, agriculture is our future. One thing you should know is that none of the people who come here to say agriculture is our future can leave their jobs and actually go into agriculture because it doesn't work. Uh, when, when I come here and I tell you tourism works, I cannot go anywhere else. Me, tourism, yes, I have a bit of interest in uh, agro-processing. But even now I have discovered if tourism worked, I would not even have a leg in in agro in agro processing, so what I'm realizing is that we need to educate people because government is the ones who consume our taxes. A lot of people in government don't understand. I'm not just talking about not talking. A lot of people in government don't understand the pain that we go through as businessmen. How much tax bodies are on our case? How many businesses right now are actually closing? But if we put serious investment towards external business strategies. Now, what I've seen the Odricks have come up with is 13 sectors that are going to be focused on external, bringing in external resources. And, but that this will mean a lot of money. I'm, I'm fearing seeing a bit of discussion on whether we should invest. You cannot, they have a dream of getting about $6 billion from the 13 sectors, including tourism, by 2028. Of course, that's a little figure compared to what Tanzania. Tanzania is targeting six billion dollars from tourism around by 2026 that's what they're targeting mm. kenya has just come up with a plan they want to have 10 million tourists not arrivals when they say 10 million tourists that means jomo kenyatta airport at that time will handle 20 million arrivals uganda has got only one airport and that one airport the best we've done is about 1.8 million passengers we can only compare ourselves to mombasa moi international airport that's what it's called now, you look at Nairobi, we cannot, we cannot come close. Nairobi, Jomo Kenyatta Airport is coming to about 8 million passengers a year. And I've always told people that if you want to know a country is progressing in terms of external business strategy, including tourism, there are two major indicators. The number of international chains of hotels. Kenya has got 88 international chains of hotels. Uganda, by 2026, we shall have four, the ones counted properly as international chains of hotels. If you look at uh, Protea, it's called a regional chain because it's from South Africa. If you look at Serena, it's called a regional chain because it's from the region. That's what it's, that's what it's called. But we're talking about Hilton's of this world, Marriott's of this world. East Africa has got about 120,000 20, rooms and 80% of them are in Kenya. Now, Tanzania is now following suit. Rwanda is actually overtaking us in the number of international. If you look at a group like Akko, which is one of the top uh, four chains of hotels in the world because they bought a, chi a Chinese chain, has seven hotels, not even a single one in Uganda. Now, I want to tell you guys, my, uh, my colleagues here from government, for them they have, uh, in, uh, they have to tell you what is good. And, and I like the fact that they also understand the industry they're telling us. But when it, when it comes to private sector, we are looking for numbers. So whoever can give us numbers is what we are looking for. Now when you look at tourism, the major part that earns more money. It's not necessarily protected areas. Nairobi can never, Masai Mara alone can never earn more money than Nairobi. Now, first of all, Kampala, we need to sit, look at Kampala as, as a tourism city. And I was just having a, a discussion with the CEO recently. I was telling her, you know what? There are four reasons why people flock into cities. That's why I have rural urban migration. Number one, people go to the cities to look for health because cities tend to have better health than any other part of the country. Number two, for education. Cities don't have better education than average towns in, in the country. Right. Cities tend to have better business opportunities than all other areas of the country. And then they are on securities. Those are the four reasons why. Now, business comes number one. That's why you need to position a city. You need to position Bali. You need to position... So if the leaders in those districts are not able to position that city, you're actually electing the wrong people. That's what I'm trying to say right now. Now... One of the best things that the Minister of Tourism has done is actually come up with the figures. And I, every Ugandan must speak interest in these figures. I have read those figures of arrivals for 2022. I was actually very impressed. Sometimes it's good to see where you stand by figures. If you don't have figures, forget it. Right. As a country, we must be waking up every morning. I wake up every morning, what are the figures? How are they going to improve? This month is just generally no business. We've killed three years. 
Now, let me give you statistics that we are nowhere. That even a country that is like Sudan probably has better statistics, in my opinion. Let me tell you. In 2022, according to their statistics, we had, which is very good, and then we need to follow this up, we had 13,000 Americans that came to Uganda. Now, compared to Kenya, compared to Kenya, Kenya in the same year had 209,000. So as a country, we did not make 20% of the tourists that came from the U.S. to Kenya. Are we together? English people were 8,000, just about 8,000. You go back and look at the statistics now of what Kenya, for example, got from the, got from the, uh, uh, got from the UK. Our, we have 10 national parks and 12 wildlife reserves combined. If you look at Germany, Germany we had about 3,000, below 3,500 individuals. Holland, we had about 1,500. Italy, we had 1,500. So when you combine what we got from all of Europe in 2022, cannot come to 50% of what the Kenya got alone from the UK. That's how bad the statistics are. You know, uh, uh, but they are good. They show us that if we all, it's not just a job of UTB, it's a job of all of us to market this country. Mm -hmm. Of course, UTB must be given resources, but also must be given a task to actually increase these numbers. If we do not do like that, private sector is suffering right now. Mm -hmm. We are suffering, like badly suffering. So now, just wait again. I'm just wanna, because Ugandans must understand these figures. In a 22 national parks and game reserves inside, combined, we have less than 1,500 beds. He can tell you that inside the parks. Now, Masai Mara, which is 1,500 uh, square kilometers there about, has close to 5,000 rooms. Are we together? Right. In 2019, this gentleman in the national parks, he had about just about 340,000 uh, tourists that went into the national parks. In 2022, because of COVID, we had a bit of numbers going up. But out of the 368,000, 70,000 were crossing through Martin Falls National Park going to Arua. 70,000. So remove 70,000 from 376,000, right? Then another 68,000 of there, about 70, were students. They are kids, very good for the future. Now you remain with about 220,000, right? Now, Wekesa does not run a tourist, a tour, a tour group that only goes to one national park. So, each, so when a tourist goes to three national parks, it's counted as an individual tourist. So you can add that together. So when you divide by two, you're na about 120,000 tourists. Right. Masai Mara in 2019 had 300,000 tourists. So one national park in Kenya had more than. Now, why I'm saying this is that we need to work so hard that he gets enough resources to be able to protect. He can tell you that out of the 22 national parks and game reserves combined, he's about, he only gets money from about six of them to look after all the national parks. So he's under pressure. In 2019 was the highest year of collection of revenue by Uganda Life Authority. Right. They collected 129 billion shillings, which is 35 million dollars. Now, Gorogoro Krata in, in Tanzania, every day collects a half a million dollars from the gate collections. Half a million dollars, 1.8 million dollars. When he has done so well, in a day, he collects 200 million shillings. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? Yeah. The so potential we have is massive. So here's the thing, and, and you're, you're throwing a lot of numbers at us, and, and, and we're trying to digest them. Yeah. Um, what I'm looking for is, in, in the analysis of all of these numbers, and yeah. you know, allow me to come to Sam for, for just a moment, because you know, the numbers you're showing sort of touch on him. Um, are we going in the right direction? Have we, have we made progress, right? Because it's possible, Amos, that you're comparing me to Kenya, who have been a big boy in this, in this sector for quite a very long time. And maybe the comparison might be a little bit unfair. For Kenya. Because of where they have been for a very long time. Again, and this is the context and why it's very important. Uh, and what I'm looking for is, from where we are as a country, have we taken a step forward at all? Um, and so, Sam, if you don't mind touching on this, in terms of our numbers. Yes, clearly, our numbers are way behind what the Kenyans are doing. Uh, the rooms, uh, I'm also talking about, are much fewer than what the Kenyans are doing. Are we growing? Are we growing at the right pace? Are we growing in a way that Amos would be pacified to say, okay, you're making 
you're going in the right direction. I go to the national parks every year. Uh, again, as I mentioned, for me personally, it's a, a thing that I said I must do. And every time I've gone to Queen Elizabeth, I do that usually once a year. Every time I go, I find maybe two or three new lodges every year. Mm, shouldn't that make almost a little bit happy to know that we're making a bit more progress? I, I'm, I'm just... I'm, I think, thank you, Bell. I think that's the question that uh, Amos should answer directly. But, right. but um, let's look at it this way. He has thrown a few numbers around and was wrapping them. Let me go slowly and give a few numbers. 2018-19 is the year that I joined Uganda Wildlife Authority as executive director. That year, we made 66 billion Uganda shillings as revenue. 2018-19, uh, sorry, 2019-20, we hit 90, I think it was 94. Can't remember off my head. Unfortunately, COVID came, we dropped to 23. Uh, last financial year, 2021-22, we climbed to 63. This year, we already have between 72 to 75 billion. I foresee us going into 90 something billion. Just looking at those figures shows you that we are progressing. I would have loved to collect 200 billion. But unfortunately, the money I have needs to be invested, and I don't have enough to invest as much. Visitors have also grown, just as you said, Ben. The numbers are growing. Uh, last calendar year, from January to December, we almost hit 370,000. That is a small number. But remember that in, in 2000, we barely made 20,000 visitors in most of our parks. So we have been growing these numbers at a rate of more than 10% per year. And that has been sustained throughout until we were hit by COVID. That's why we are already in 300,000. Actually, this financial year, we expect to be in 380,000. We are hitting new figures. We've never been that high in our national parks before. So we are doing better, but we could do much better if we invested a little bit more. Yeah. So yes, we have challenges, and, and, and he should also know that actually in terms of beds in national parks, we, we, we had a few issues investing especially in Queen Elizabeth and Marchion Falls. And so we have more beds outside of Queen Elizabeth than inside. And he's not counting those ones. But they are very important to the visitors who visit Queen Elizabeth, the visitors around Kibale. There are also more lodges. Actually, his is the only one in Kibale, by the way. Uh, lodges in Kibale. So is, uh, is not a lodge. That, that, that's a small facility that we are managing. <laughs> For lodges, the quality right. that a visitor will really go and enjoy, we have one in Kibale. The rest are outside. But there are many. Yeah. The same thing applies to Maction Falls. And I think the issue here is not whether we should have them inside, but whether we have enough to accommodate our visitors. Um, which I think Unfortunately, we don't have enough, but we are working on having more. Currently, uh, th this morning I was working on a document to go into Solicitor General. We are working on 12 new agreements for investors in national parks that we should be signing hopefully in May. 12 that should give us more than 150 beds in various national parks and we will continue improving on this so that you know visitors can come and stay now for ugandans like ben 
and roll in. Who do not want to pay the money that this man requires you to pay in Kivali? They are opportunities that we have provided for what we call mid and low and budget travelers yeah. that are, can actually come and visit. And those you've been to Kidepo, you are talking of the Uwa camp. That kind of facility that actually allows a Ugandan to go and you pay 70,000 yep. and you're able to sleep and enjoy and sometimes wake up with zebra around you. Uh, once in a while, you might actually find a lion on the doorstep. Hopefully, it hopefully a, not. It God. can be a very great experience, no, I can assure no, you. No, thank you, Sam. <laughs> God, a lion outside my doorstep uh, I'd, <laughs> might have me for breakfast. Um, <laughs> no, it won't have you for breakfast because it will be well fed. And the moment <laughs> it is seen, they will alert you not to get out until we guide it away and then you can get out safely. Yeah. So, I, again, um, before we come to Madame Pierce, let me come to Lily to answer the question that uh, I must refuse to answer. Um, if I'm <laughs> selling Uganda <laughs> to a Ugandan, <laughs> okay, how do I sell this to them? Because one of the things, and I think someone touched on it, the fact that uh, a lot of people will say that the costs are too high for people to be able to travel around Uganda. I can categorically say that I don't think that's true and I'm a living testimony of this because of what I've been able to do around again. When we went to Kidepo the last time I was there, we were staying in the Uwa camp, had a wonderful experience paying 80,000 shillings a night, right? Which uh, for the average Ugandan, if you, even if you were to say I'm going to save, right, you can be able to attain that. Right, uh, a stone's throw away from the camp is a lodge where I think they charge about 400 or $500 a night. Right? So there is sort of something for everybody. So, uh, Lily, for you, for the people who are watching Spotlight, you just always oh, said Lorin is our guinea pig. <laughs> so, if, if you're selling Uganda to Lorin, for us to encourage her to begin to get this thing in her where she needs to start exploring her country, how would you sell Uganda to the Ugandan? Because the domestic tourism we know must be at the heart of any sustainable tourism development sector for any country. Thank you, Ben. Um, one thing for sure is the interest of Ugandans are definitely different from the international tourists who come here. Uh, one very clear fact is Ugandans just love their drinks and music. Yeah, that will get them to travel anywhere. Yeah, these days every weekend Fort Porto is full. Yeah, you hardly get accommodation in Fort Porto over the weekends. The people from Kampala, from Barara are traveling to Fort Porto because there are happenings there. Yeah? There is always entertainment, there is music, they can enjoy themselves over the weekend and then drive away. Two, uh, we have a very young population. And uh, these young population are interested in, in adventure. They want to move out and do things that, that, are, that keeps them active, that gets them to you know, feel the adrenaline you know, rushing. We are seeing a lot of Ugandans going for rafting, for bungee jumping, for zip lining, um, hiking. It has become trendy these days for the young Ugandans to go hike. We have different clubs besides the mountain clubs of Uganda where we have a lot of Ugandans who are members. There, there's also the mountain slayers. These guys every month go somewhere you know, to hike for hours and hours over the weekend before they come back to Kampala. You know, they are corporates, you know, they are, you know, the young Ugandans who are hustling, you know, with their lives, that's what the Ugandans are looking for. And we have this opportunity all around the country. And I think one thing that um, uh, I believe we are doing right in trying to capture the Ugandans audience market is the campaigns we are running, yeah? Explore West, 
had closely close to 5,500, you know, from within Kampala, you know, traveling to the West together with our Minister of State, you know, stopping at different points. But in there, there was always the evening where they had to have their music, have their drinks, the storytellings. That's the vibe that Ugandans want. And it's happening. When we had Explore Elgon, it was the same thing. So Ugandans just don't want to go and see the wildlife and, you know, your typical example, you're saying you don't want to wake up and there's a lion by, by, by your door, but uh, someone else coming from Europe, that would be the most special experience they would yeah. have got from, from, uh, from, from Uganda. But for you, as a Ugandan, what you want to do is, yes, go to Semiliki, see the hot springs, see, you know, walk in the forest, see what you have to see, track the chimpanzees, get out of there, go and enjoy your night with your loud music and so on. So I think it's happening in all the cities around Uganda right now. Yeah, yeah whether you go to Arua, you know, Aru Falls, there are so many who are going for weekends to experience Aru Falls, but also have the music and, you know, uh, have the other side of the life that they, they want to have, the experience right. they, want to, yeah. they want to have. But also very important is also our heritage, the, the culture. I think we are also at the point where you know, for those who have grown around the city, born and, you know, grown around the city, are actually looking for their identity. So given an opportunity, you know, to travel, you know, back to the villages, they're taking this opportunity to discover where their heritage is. So the interest of the Ugandans is totally different. Right. And uh, we are trying to capture that right now and develop what interests them, what meets their interest, uh, which is slightly different. And they tend to travel in groups. They tend to travel as families. We are seeing lots of families, you know, over the, um, the holiday times, Christmas, New Year, Easter, you find, you know, uh, Ugandans traveling as families. So it's important for us to uh, understand the market uh, segment from that point of view of the Ugandans as well. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Madam P.S. Now, Amos has touched on certain issues. Uh, for example, the numbers that we're having in the country com in comparison to our neighbors in the East African community, for example, Kenya. What has the ministry, um, what interventions has the ministry put in place so that we achieve and hike some of these numbers, you know, for sustainable tourism development in Uganda. Thank you, Lorreen. And um, before I answer that question, I wanted to comment on what Ben said. I think sometimes we, we tend to forget where we have come from because our history is slightly different from some of our neighbors. Uh, if you look at the wildlife, for example, uh, once upon a time, we had rhinos in this country. We even have a place in, in West Nile called Rhino Camp. Today, you can only find the rhinos at the zoo. The reason the rhinos were extinct is because of the history we've had. I don't think Kenya has had the kind of civil strife and wars that we went through. So by 1986, I think when the gov this government took over, most of our wildlife populations were almost depleted. So we've been building, building from down. And uh, I think we've done a fairly good job. But like Sam was saying, uh, the room for improvement is always the biggest room, they say. But so comparing uh, our numbers of tourists, for example, with our neighbors, and I'm always having <laughs> this argument with Emos. When you look at the numbers, the global numbers, actually, you'll find that in terms of the actual figures, Kenya will probably have 100,000 more 
the, when we were, before COVID, we were at about 1.5 million tourists. Kenya was probably 1.6, 1.7. The difference, however, is in the quality, or should I say the ratio. You'll find that in Kenya, about 60% of the tourists are leisure tourists. They're people who are coming for holidays. And those tend to stay longer and spend more. Whereas we were ranging between 20 to 30 percent of the leisure tourists. So the other tourists, or should I say travelers, are people who are coming to visit relatives, people coming maybe to attend meetings, uh, to do business. Now those will, will stay less days and maybe spend less. So in terms of numbers, I think we, we, we've done fairly well. However, what do we need to do, therefore? To increase the ratio of the leisure tourists, but also to increase the numbers, because we are targeting by the end of the NDP period to at least have uh, one point, to be raising 1.8 billion US dollars. We had hit 1.6 billion uh, by the time COVID hit. Of course, COVID hit and we went down. The last time we did the numbers for 2022, we were at about 800,000. So what do we need to do? And again, this is what the other panelists have been talking about. Uh, Emos has emphasized this. We need to do more marketing, but we have to invest. You cannot reap where you haven't sown. We have to invest as a country. We have to invest more resources and do the marketing aggressively. Mm. But secondly, is something you touched again about the products. We have to diversify. We have to have more products, but also improve the products that we have. So our tourism has largely been based on nature, like Sam was saying. People come here to see the wildlife. But the wildlife that we have, most of our neighbors also have. Maybe apart from the gorillas, which we share with, with Rwanda and DRC, the other big five are in, in, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Tanzania. So we need to focus more on those things that make us unique. And uh, I think Lily has already talked about the culture. We have seen, for example, when we, we have done these domestic tourism campaigns, the young people, the Lorene type, want, we have young people who have grown in the city and they have seen their parents buy milk from the supermarket, they have never seen milk come out of a cow. They don't know where milk comes from. So when they travel and go and experience this cultural experience and see how milk is taken out of a cow, how it is made into ghee, or if they can travel to Gulu and, and see how Malakwang is done now, the same applies even to international tourists. How do we make them come Yes, we want, to see the, we want them to see the wildlife. That is our biggest source of revenue. But how do we make them stay longer and spend more? So if somebody has come and they have done a game drive, maybe in Queen Elizabeth or also go to Markshon, we need other products. And that's why we are now focusing on things like community tourism. So that the communities are able to have activities that can make a tourist. People are actually more interested in learning about the society they come to see. How do people live? Well, how do they uh, entertain themselves? Then you have uh, adventure activities, like uh, Lily was talking about. You have the water, the River Nile. We haven't m made much use of that. We haven't made much use of, of the Lake Victoria. And so many other cultural tourism activities that we can really take advantage of. We have the source of the Nile. Again, it was talked about. We are going to develop the source of the Nile so that we make it um, a, a, an international class of a tourism destination. People go to, I have been to the Suez Canal. Now, there's only one source of the Nile. So peop, there are people who come to the source of the Nile. I'll give you an example of, of the Indians because they know that the, when Mahatma Gandhi died, the, his ashes were sprinkled, the source of the Nile. So some of them, it is a pilgrimage. We have the Uganda Matters. It is a very big attraction. We have people 
in Nigeria, in other countries, who are named after Ugandan matters. Mm. So we want to make that a product so that it's not just on Matters Day, 3rd of June, but throughout the year you have a Matters Trail and it can attract a lot of tourists. So that's what we, we mean by product diversification and improving uh, the products that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam P.S. Uh, so before we hear a little bit about maybe what challenges there might be, uh, and I think Lorraine has a couple of questions to ask. We are trying to go forward, right, and paint a rosy picture, but there must be things that must be dealt with, and whatever things those are will be dealt with. Let's talk briefly about the opportunities that, that we have. Um, when we were preparing for this broadcast, I was looking at some of the, the figures, and uh, I've got to say it is mind-boggling when you think about the potential that tourism has for us as a country, and I'll start with you, Amos, and then we'll go across, across the room. Um, Dubai, every year, and I think we've talk, talked about it on the show so far, where I think some mentioned it, where Ugandans go on their honeymoon to be driven around in air conditioned the cars just driving on the sand for a week and they'll spend money there. <laughs> on average, people spend the equivalent of about 104 trillion Uganda shillings in yeah. cash in, in Dubai per year. Yeah. Um, France receives on average about 84 million people every year. Um, Spain. Tour those are tourists, not numbers. Yeah? yeah. Spain, 68.5 million. Italy, it's a small country, receives about 50.7 million tourists visiting it uh, literally every year. And you've got investments of more than $800 billion every year across the world being put into tourism. So starting with you, Amos, going across the room, um, you, you're always telling me to get into tourism. You've been preaching this to me for many, many years now. We hear people say that about agriculture, and then they go and try farming, and things backfire completely for them. I want you to assure Ugandans watching the show tonight that there is opportunity for us, uh, not only just as a country in tourism, but as individuals. And from your perspective, where are those opportunities? And then we'll hear from some, from Madame Pierce, from Lily, and from uh, Dr. Musinguzi. And then we'll talk a little bit about the challenges that we must overcome uh, if we're going to achieve our, our, our goals for tourism in Uganda. I think for me, as, as, as Amos, um, what I think government must do is Part in an article I wrote on my Twitter today. When you get money, first money must be invested in what is going to bring cash flows to grow fast. For example, if you say agriculture is our future, why should you have close to 400? Me, I like talking figures. Why should you have close to 450 cars, 450,000 cars, both old and old by government people? And here there are 1,500 tractors in the whole country. It's what I'm talking about. So you can't say agriculture is our future. So you can also say that tourism is our future. After a big fight, Parliament had allocated about 90 billion, 97 billion, which is lower than what Uganda Wildlife Authority probably is going to collect this year. But for, Andrew, for, for my CEO's uh, information, in 2019, he collected 129 billion shillings, which is 2019. 2019. The, the 66. No, no, no. You, I'm are, right. Yeah. you are right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, you know, I like figures. Era. Yes. I yes. like figures and I, I do not, because you can cross check with these figures. And for my PS, I want to say that we need to be a little bit, we need to say, okay, if Kenya got in 2022, got 209,000 Americans and Uganda got, according to their statistics, 13,000. How do we fight to get from 13,000 from America to 20,000? Right. If we got 8,000 tourists from the UK in 2022 and Kenya got to about 200 and something thousand, how do we get there? Think about the reasons why Kenya has, we can, why we're not even getting 10% of what Kenya is getting from the UK. One, Kenya has three direct flights every day. Kenya always does two flights to UK every day, 14 flights a week. Kenya always. British always does one flight a day. For us, we cannot fill a single plane from Amsterdam to come to Entebbe directly. You see what I'm talking about? So that, that's an opportunity. So right? now we need to go and say, how do we entice more airlines to come to Entebbe? The Entebbe has got about only eight or nine or ten, flight, ten air com uh, fly, uh, international uh, Carrier, air companies carriers. flying into Entebbe. Right. And about six cargo. Jomo Kenyatta Airport alone 
has 40 passenger planes in one airport and 25 cargo planes. That means we are so far behind. But the challenge is that we cannot sleep. We are producing children every, every day. Right. Yeah? We are producing one, between 1 1.3 to 1 1.5 million new Ugandans every day. We are at 47 million Ugandans. So we must wake up and work hard. Now, after a fight between government, government guys, we are in, we're in the battles together. We don't disagree many times. I'm a private sector. Private sector out there is struggling, is suffering. We're the ones who pay the taxes and things are hard. What government did has taken the budget of tourism, whole of tourism, including his about 90,000, to 214 billion shillings. That is equivalent to the amount of money Kenya uses for only social media marketing. I see what I'm talking about. Go and do research. If you think I'm lying, don't invite me to this show again. <laughs> Rwanda, our neighbors, have themselves on Arsenal t-shirt. They're on PSG. They're targeting another group. They're pushing for... You, you, I can't tell you about this until cows come home. We will not compete. Now, now they're building an airport, a second airport. The first, when in three years, that airport should be, they will be targeting 8.4 million passengers in the first stage. Right. After the second stage, it will be 14.5 million. We need to have these dreams and those desires. When I tell people in government that as a country, let's target 3 million tourists, people think that's too ambitious. When Kenya is targeting 10, we, I think we will undermine who we are. So number one is that Minister of Finance, instead of buying brand new cars that you see for ministers all over, let's put money in positioning and branding this country. Give UTB enough budget. And after you have given UTB enough budget, give them targets. If they don't meet their targets, fire them. That's how life is supposed to be. Because you'll be sacrificing a country for individuals. But before you fire them, give them money. Give them enough resources. Give, give the peers here enough resources so that when Wekesa comes here, he's not angry. Right. I am not, I, am, I love Uganda. So here's the thing, Amos. I, I need to ask you, uh, again, very briefly so I can go around the room. Um, yeah. Again, I'm looking for the opportunity, right? Yes. So if you're asking Madame Pierce here to go and be able to lobby and fight for more funding and resources, right? Yeah. Does it make sense for you to be able to paint the picture of what the return on investment is, the opportunity to what? be, to be ins instead of comparing what Kenya and Uganda look like for me, show me where my opportunity is as a country you that is going to come out of this investment that you want them to be able you to put You see, Ben, when we stop comparing ourselves, it's running away from reality. When I go to the US, I'm a member of American Two Operators Association, right? I go in the same room with Kenyans. I go in the same room as Tanzanians. I go in the same room as Rwandese. But for me, to even tell the people the United States in Uganda, they think I'm so patriotic that I'm lying. Why? Because the bigger picture has not been achieved. For Kenya, they have invested over $50 million in just projecting themselves on social media. Yeah? So when they talk about their country, the world knows. Eh? The other day I was trying to tell you that one of the reasons why these three years have even been miserable is because of Minister of Health. Minister of Health, and I like what the president, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what Robogo, Odrick, and uh, the president are trying to do now. They're saying no one should just wake up and start making statements. We, we told them, okay, guys, there's COVID in, in Mubendi. We told our whole, we deal with what they call wholesalers in Europe, which Kenya deals with, which Tanzania deals with, South Sudan deals with, Congo deals with, everybody deals with the same tourists, two operators. Now, I tell the guys, by the way, there's a problem only in Mubendi. Then the next morning they send you, uh, uh, what did they call it? When you catch a photo, they show you a picture of the Minister of, Fina of, uh, of Health saying, now it is in Natete, it's now where. She's like, so they're telling you, you are, you are lying. Now, after COVID, they put in so much effort, they call the media, engage about what is wrong. Today, I can give you an email of two weeks ago where tourists are saying, but you have Ebola in Uganda. Why? The efforts we put in to talk negativity is not equivalent to the efforts we put in when things are done. It's like we want to kill. The, then Minister of, Finance, Minister of Health wants to go and collect the money. It's what I'm talking about. So for me, as, as Amos, I am saying we have so much potential. But no one is going to eat potential. And I've been saying this. As a country, and I think this is... Sorry, sorry. And this is very important for Ugandans to listen. For the first time, people are starting to listen. 
Because I have said that if we attract 3 million passengers through that airport, 3 million tourists, let's say that, 3 right. million. First of all, at the airport, uh, the trickle-down effect. At the airport alone, we shall earn $300 million just collected at the airport. $50 is collected on a visa. That $150 times, times 3 million is what? $150 million, right? Right. Another $50 million on every ticket. So every, if, if a Ugandan is traveling between Nairobi and Entebbe, you pay $50 as airport tax in Entebbe and another $50 as airport tax in Nairobi. So the airline starts charging you from $100. So now that would be another extra $50 times, uh, times 3 million. That's $150 what? $50 million. $150 million times 2. 300. 300 million dollars. Yeah. Now, as a guy in the Ministry of Finance, I would invest any day 30 million dollars, even if to get to get 3 million tourists coming through the airport. Because I would earn 10 times. It's very common, it's common sense. Now, that tourist starts, you know, with Kesa, the, the biggest, by the way, the biggest operators of tourism in the country are not two operators. A tourist, a person leaves place A, goes to place B, and spends over 24 hours. Right. The buses, those buses you see, Kalita, are the biggest transporters of tourists, domestic tourists, and so on. However, Wekesa now sends the tourist to, they send the car to the airport. That car has a driver, it, ha it takes fuel, which supports people. That car has a mechanic, has a mechanic, uh, uh, spare part suppliers. But let me give you what has actually woken up people. When I say 3 million tourists in the country, an average tourist will eat two eggs a day. An average tourist in Uganda, according to the research by Minister of Tourism, thank God, spends eight days in the country. So two eggs times eight days, it comes to 16 eggs, right? Right. Times, times three million is 48 million eggs. Do the mathematics of 40 million, 48 million eggs. Yeah. Each tour is, each run, uh, that is, they do the mathematics, the transport, the feeds, the what, the economy around are just eggs alone. Right. This tour is, takes two cups of coffee every day. One in the morning, minimum. Most tourists take four, but let's take two. One in the morning, one in the evening. Those are two cups. Time was eight days. Is how many cups? It's 16 cups. Time was three million, is 48 million cups. Now let me give you where the figures are. And that's why I like talking figures. When you look, you Google now, one kilo, one kilo of coffee gives you between 120 to 140 cups. Now, if you said in the UK, coffee now is 3.5 pound per cup of coffee, per cup of coffee. If we sold that cup of coffee at just one dollar here, one dollar here, we will have made 120 dollars from a kilo of coffee at minimum. However, let's say 60 percent. 150% of it is expenses. Right. You'll have still sold a kilo of coffee locally here at $60. Now, no, no, now the minimum, the, the, the last so, part of it. Coffee today, the best coffee from is my village, Bugiso. And a bit of a console have a bit of my sister there, I can tell you. Right. It's 11,500 shillings. That is how terrible it is. Do the mathematics now. They so, sleep in accommodation. That's what I'm trying to say. No, absolutely. So again, uh, for the rest of the panel, Sam, we'll start with you. Uh, briefly going across the room, um, Amos wants 3 million tourists to be able to visit Uganda. Um, what opp opportunities do you see for us um, in terms of being able to try and maybe get there, no matter how long it takes us, um, in the immediate future? Because we're thinking about, again, journey of 1,000 miles, one step. From what I'm hearing so far, we are moving in the right direction. What opportunity do we have to be able to go where we need to go? Let me start with figures. <laughs> uh, it's rubbing I, I, I wonder where we have heard that it, before. It is, rubbing, it is rubbing off me from my, my, my neighbor, Amos. Um, I've had a chance to look at my audited accounts. Uganda Wale for audited accounts quickly. 2016-17, our generated internal generated revenue was 67 billion. 17-18, the year I arrived in UWA was 106 billion. 2018-19 was 120 billion. The nine he's talking about includes 
uh, money that comes in from donors. 1920, we dropped, because that's when COVID came in, 102 billion. 2020-21 was 28 billion. Now, I didn't have the chance to look at the others, but I know that 2020 one twenty two we had sixty three billion so it's going back you know we dropped to twenty eight sixty three we are going up again this financial year I now will be ninety something if not a hundred what that tells you is that if we you weren't investing in anything tourism the money is there and so you're asking how do we go forward? We go forward by looking at the opportunities we have. Do you want to be a tour operator? There is business for you. Do you want to go into accommodation? There is business for you. Do you want to rear chicken and sell eggs that Temos is talking about? How many million eggs? 48 million eggs? 48 million. Yeah. There is business for you in agriculture. There is business for you in transport. There is business for you manufacturing. in manufacturing. There is business for you in almost every field you want because they will be feeding into tourism, even if it is domestic tourism. Right. So the opportunities are there. Now, what we need as government is to create the environment that allows this business says to flourish. So we need the products. You know, you can actually do a product as Ben or Rolin, eh, yourselves, and do a product on your piece of land somewhere. People will come. But we, as government, must also provide the products. The national parks have enough of those, but we're also working on other things that I think PS will talk about which are outside of the national parks. Yeah. Then we need facilities. But the facilities, let's leave them to the private sector. Let them build the lodges so that you know, people are able to sleep there and pay and the private investors are able to get the resources, the right. money. And then as government, we should market. We should go out there tell the Americans, tell the Chinese, tell the Russians, yes, yes, tell the Europeans, yes. that the place to come is the Pearl of Africa. Yeah. Come and explore. You will enjoy when you come. Yeah. And then provide the supporting infrastructure for businesses to run. Uh, the banks, the telecommunication, uh, the roads, those need to be built and that should be government role. So right. I think we, we don't want to leave the potholes as tourist attractions. We are told that they might become... Uh, no, no, no. no. We, <laughs> the, 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 you, you know how the economy has struggled because of COVID. Yeah, no, that's just so so the, the potholes <laughs> will be dealt with. And right. already the president gave a directive. So l l let's trust that something is right. going to be done. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Over to you, Lily. Um, what are some of the challenges or hindrances that you feel you have encountered while trying to market Uganda as one of the best tourism destinations in the world and uh, what do you feel the government should do or the Ministry of Tourism should do you know in order to help you solve some of these challenges thank you um, the obvious one has already been mentioned the budget issue uh, we definitely need more investments uh, in marketing the destination. There has been some investment that government has put into marketing the country. Um, it's not enough, but also beyond what is given to Uganda Tourism Board or under the Ministry of uh, Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, we need to look at the investments we have like in Uganda Airlines. It's a marketing tool for the country as well. So um, budget, we definitely need more. Uh, I think one of the things that we need to understand with our marketing is that over the years, 
most of the budget that has been given to Uganda Tourism Board has gone into creating um, business linkages. Yeah, so when we go for the tourism expos, whether in Europe, America, wherever, it is more business to business linkages that we have been creating. But where we are now, we need to get to the consumers, the global consumers, where we get brand Uganda out there and everybody around the world get to know there is this brand called Uganda, there is that country called Uganda. There has to be a consumer campaign that we must do to be able to drive the numbers from the consumer to the business you know, uh, person, the tour operator or uh, the travel agents in Europe or America by telling them, oh, may I want to go to Uganda. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the budget to that level where we can run some consumer, global consumer campaigns to position brand Uganda out there. Um, yes, uh, budget is definitely an issue. Again, you know, the products needs to be enhanced, diversified, so that we are able to keep the, the travelers longer in the country and more from it. Um, the level at which they are in terms of standards needs to be improved. Some of the access uh, roads to some of the key iconic attractions we have are still um, wanting, so we need to invest more in the infrastructure um, and the existing existing um, uh, products, but also to diversify. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to diversify um, the, the 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 products as well elaborated by the PS earlier. Okay. Uh, the other challenge we have is with the skill. Yeah. We really need to improve on the quality of our services. I think a lot of the education that our, um, our students are having is more theoretical. We need practical training for them uh, such that when you go to a restaurant and you know a waiter, a waitress comes to you, you really feel you are in the right place you know, and you get the service that you deserve. So that is still, mm. you know, it's still a struggle for us. Okay. Yeah. And of course, government has put in some investment in the Uganda Hotel Training Institute, Tourism and Training Institute in Jinja, but the capacity is still limited. So that's an area that really, really needs focus. Okay. And um, um, with that, uh, as Uganda Tourism Board, we actually one of our responsibility is to manage the standards of services and facilities in this country, and uh, the process of licensing the licensing the two operators, travel agents, hotels, you know, the restaurants is ongoing. And um, we are trying as much as possible to create awareness, get everyone to understand how it should be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also we are at the point where we are going to have to do enforcement for yes. us to really achieve the standard that we need. Thank so you. we want to call upon you know, um, all the investors in the tourism sector. That let's be nice about this because it will pay more yeah. and uh, one of the big benefits i think it is two the last week uh, for the last two weeks we have been running in the print media mm -hmm. the list of all those who are licensed by uganda tourism board that alone is a is a is a marketing benefit right. for the facilities and the operators who are actually licensed with us okay. and on our website Every single day that there is a new operator that gets licensed, you get onto our website, and this is one way that we are trying to regulate the standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the Pearl of Africa Tourism Expo, which is happening this week um, after 
Is it after today? T- yeah. Tomorrow, actually, because we are, we are already, tomorrow, we are already yes. in Tuesday, so starting tomorrow. It's right. starting yeah. tomorrow. Um, it will be a, this expo is a great opportunity for all Ugandans to come yeah. and learn, right. you know, and, um, uh, and exhibit for those who are in the sector, exhibit, you know, showcase what they have, sell yeah. their packages. And we are bringing in, uh, we have actually brought in over a hundred, you know, um, hosted buyers from across the globe, Europe, you know, America and elsewhere to come and do business with us. They're here. They came uh, last week. They have been touring the country to know exactly what Uganda has to offer. Now, this week, when they have the business to business meeting, they will be signing contracts with some of the operators so that you know they are able now to bring more numbers to yeah. Ugandans. So I want to take this opportunity to invite all Ugandans not to miss this opportunity. Yeah. We have really some great some great things that will be happening at Munyonyo from 26th to 29th when we are having the Pearl of Africa Tourism Expo. Yeah. And um, So th- that's pretty much the whole of this week. And again, I think like uh, Sam mentioned, lots of opportunity. If you want to get into the tourism business, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to go and learn from other people and see what you can be able to get from there. So uh, that's happening in Munyonyo starting tomorrow, this tomorrow being Wednesday, uh, throughout the entire week. Uh, we are out of time. However, I will allow you, Dr. Musingzu, to share any parting shots. If you want to invite Ugandans to Uwek, I'll give you uh, you know a few seconds to do that, and then we'll have a, a last word from um, uh, uh, Mama Tourism, uh, a, a title which she has graciously accepted tonight as we wrap up Spotlight UG tonight, Dr. Musingzu. Thank you, Ben. Um, I just want to throw more light about some opportunities that do exist for sustainable tourism uh, promotion, but also sustainable wildlife management because we are promoting sustainable wildlife utilization. So I invite Ugandans to invest in the wildlife sector. We would like to see more ranches. We would like to see more zoos out there like you were asking about a lion. If you came, you can get a license and we support you so that you can create jobs for Ugandans. But we would also like to see partnerships grow. We would like to see conservation festivals. We would like to see naming of animals, animal adoption. So there are quite a number of opportunities and partnerships that we can do together. We also have opportunities for young people, volunteer opportunities, internship opportunities, apprenticeships for our young people to be able to get skills. Right now we have received some requests from zoos in Dubai, in the UAE, South Africa, the US. They are looking out for African wildlife managers and animal keepers. So we take them through this and we can get them some opportunities abroad and jobs. So there are quite a lot uh, of opportunities that do exist. And um, as a parting shot, um, I just want to use the the words of, of, of Dwayne who says success actually. It's not about greatness, but rather consistency. I just want to call upon Ugandans in whatever you do, try and emphasize consistency. That's the secret that we have used at UEC. We've been consistent in what we've been doing and also paying attention to detail, which is quite lacking in this country. If we pay attention to detail, we become consistent in what we do, we shall succeed and achieve sustainable life utilization. Thank you. Thank you, and I can tell you as your client at work, I, I completely affirm what you're saying, and I'm a witness that it is actually spot on. Uh, Madam PS, you have the last word on Spotlight UG tonight. Uh, a key takeaway for our audience watching uh, to take away with them uh, as we wrap up the show. Uh, Thank you very much. I think I have about two or three parting words. One is about the numbers. I I thought I should say this. Uh, Since I came to the Ministry of Tourism, I have been asking myself what we can do to grow the numbers. Because like Amos is telling you, the private sector is always saying what we want is the numbers. Grow the numbers. Now, I, I was reading and I found out that studies, studies have been done and have shown that numbers of tourism arrivals double over an average of 10 years. And that's why you find that even our neighbors who have had relatively peaceful uh, period and have grown their numbers have not really 
surpassed the numbers that we have. So if we, have, we had about 1.5, in other words, you're talking about 3 million 10 years after 2019, minus the COVID. So I think as a sector for us now, we should focus more. Yes, we want the numbers. We should focus more on how much we make out of tourism rather than just focusing on the number of tourism arrivals. So we should focus on the, the quality of tourists, the products that can make the tourists stay longer and spend more. So that is where our focus is right now. I thought I should say that. Now, the other issue that I thought I should talk about, which you had raised, was about the opportunities. And I think the opportunities have really been largely talked about. The beauty of the Pearl of Africa is, is a big opportunity that we need to take advantage of. The security of this country is, is I can walk out of here and, and walk home, even at midnight. Of course, there will be a few incidences of, of some insecurity, but compared to many countries, I think we are secure. But we also have, I think we have a fairly friendly investment climate. So people can come here and invest and they repatriate their profits. So we have a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Now finally, in terms of taking advantage of those opportunities, I would look at them in terms of our, our broad strategic objectives as, as a sector. And uh, these are, I think, represented by all of us here. When we look at, about, at conservation, we are, and we are talking about conservation of natural and cultural heritage, we need to focus on the different strategies and plans that we can to improve. And that's what uh, the ED of who I was talking about. And that includes a lot of things, protecting the habitats, uh, conserving our biodiversity, fighting against poaching and illegal wildlife trade, and all the things that we do in there. And then the, our cultural heritage, conserving and uh, preserving some of these. Then we're talking about diversification of products. I don't want to dwell on that. We've talked about the different products. Now we are going into agro-tourism, for example. There are people who, like I talked about milk, now there is coffee, there is tea. People want to go and see how tea is made from the leaf up to, to the cup. Then the aggressive marketing, which is another strategic objective. Uh, both domestic and international. I don't think w it is good to focus on the international tourism, but one thing that COVID taught us is that the domestic market is equally important, mm. and you need to really focus on it. And uh, maybe I should add here that one thing that COVID has shown us is that the, w we had not really focused on the domestic market. Mm. Because with the few campaigns we've made, for example, I don't, I, think, I don't know if the ED of UWEC talked about this. The numbers at, of visitors at UWEC grew by more than 100% yep. after COVID. 406,000. Absolutely. Uh, crazy numbers. We have seen bigger numbers visiting the national parks of Ugandans. Yeah. For the first time, we had more than 60% of the visitors in the national parks being Ugandans. This had not happened before COVID. So I think we, we have an opportunity to grow the domestic market alongside the international market. And then uh, the, the fourth one is skilling. Uh, Lily has alluded to it. We still have a big challenge there. We are still importing a lot of our hotel managers. They are, I don't know if uh, Emos has been importing for his lodges. People are even in, importing, are they called bar baristas? People who manage their bars. Yeah. And, so we, we have to really focus on the skilling. We are working on that. We are restructuring our schools. The school in Kasese, I don't know if Lorraine has visited that school. And the school in, <laughs> in Jinja, where we train for hot hospitality and tourism. Yeah. And then the infrastructure, and uh, it's, it's good everybody has talked about it. The president has now directed about the aerodromes. The rich people who are coming to spend money here are rich in money, but they are not rich in time. So they are not going to spend 12 hours on the road and the drive from Kampala to Kidepo. They want to fly. Mm. So if we don't have these aerodromes, at least let's have in each part of the, of the country yeah. 
we have good so that you know people can spend less time but be able to so we have uh, we have all talked about Kidepo and we all seem to be in agreement that is the most beautiful park we have but it's the least visited we have the mountain Renzori it is I haven't climbed but those who climb say it's one of the most spectacular the, the best I think Lily has been up to the the peak so we need to do more of those uh, so I think we, we, the opportunities are really plenty and uh, we can still we still have a lot to do to harness the potential fully yeah thank you very much, uh, thank you very much Madam uh, P.S. Doreen Katsime Permanent Secretary Ministry of uh, Tourism Wildlife and Antiquities uh, Mr. Sam Wanda Executive Director at Uganda Wildlife Authority Mr. Amos Wekesa CEO at uh, Great Lakes Safaris uh, Ms. Lily Ajarova, CEO uh, ED at uh, Uganda Tourism Board, as well as uh, Dr. Msinguzi, who is ED at Uganda Wildlife Education Center. It's an absolute pleasure to have had you on Spotlight UG tonight. Obviously, there is a lot of uh, room for growth and opportunity, as we're hearing tonight. Uh, and also, especially for Lorraine, uh, some trips to look forward to. We've yes, got some offers for people want to be your photographer on the trip. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I've got a, a, a person who wants to be a Bodyguard, bodyguard to be the bodyguard yes. so uh <laughs> looks like we will have an, an entire entourage as we go around it's been an absolute pleasure being with you tonight as well likewise it's been an honor and i've definitely um learned a lot from this whole discussion so i thank you so and, much and we want to say a big thank you to you for being with us uh, throughout this entire show and i encourage you to go and explore this wonderful part of Africa that we call home on behalf of our entire production crew here at UBC and NBS TV. I want to say good night to you. God bless you. And God bless Uganda. Bless you Thank too. You. Bless you. Inspiring Uganda.